Section 6.6.4 Hypercube Routing Hypercube routing is a mechanism which can mostly be billed as an extension to the basic routing mechanism described above. Essentially, rather than growing the node connectivity with the number of parachains and subgroup nodes, we grow only with the logarithm of parachains. Posts may transit between several parachains' queues on their way to final delivery. Routing itself is deterministic and simple. We begin by limiting the number of bins in the ingress-egress queues rather than being the total number of parachains. They are the routing base, open parentheses, lowercase b, close parentheses. This will be fixed as the number of parachains changes with the routing exponent, open parentheses, lowercase e, close parentheses, instead being raised. Under this model, our message volume grows with uppercase O, open parentheses, B to the power of lowercase e, close parentheses, with the pathways remaining constant and the latency, or number of blocks required for delivery, with uppercase O, open parentheses, lowercase e, close parentheses. Our model of routing is a hypercube of lowercase e dimensions, with each side of the cube having lowercase b possible locations. Each block, we route messages along a single axis. We alternate the axes in a round-robin fashion, thus guaranteeing worst-case delivery time of lowercase e blocks. As part of the parachain processing, foreign bound messages found in the ingress queue are routed immediately to the appropriate egress queue's bin. Given the current block number, and thus routing dimension, the process necessitates additional data transfer for each hop in the delivery route. However, this is a problem itself which may be mitigated by using some alternative means of data payload delivery and including only a reference rather than the full payload of the post in the post tree. An example of such a hypercube routing for a system with four parachains lowercase b equals 2 and lowercase e equals 2 might be phase 0 on each message uppercase m. Section 6.6.5 Maximizing Serendipity One alteration of the basic proposal would see a fixed total of lowercase c squared minus c validators with lowercase c minus 1 validators in each subgroup. Each block, rather than there being an unstructured repartitioning of validators among parachains, instead for each parachain subgroup, each validator would be assigned to a unique and different parachain subgroup on the following block. This would lead to the invariant that between any two blocks, for any two pairings of parachain, there exists two validators who have swapped parachain responsibilities. While this cannot be used to gain absolute guarantees on availability, a single validator will occasionally drop offline, even if benevolent. It can nonetheless optimize the general case. This approach is not without complications. The addition of a parachain would also necessitate a reorganization of the validator set. Furthermore, the number of validators being tied to the square of the number of parachains would start initially very small and eventually grow far too fast becoming untenable after around 50 parachains. None of these are fundamental problems. In the first case, reorganization of validator sets is something that must be done regularly anyway. Regarding the size of the validator set, when too small, multiple validators may be assigned to the same parachain, applying an integer factor to the overall total of validators. A multi-phase routing mechanism such as hypercube routing discussed in 6.6.4, would alleviate the requirement for a large number of validators when there is a large number for a large number of validators when there is a large number of chains. Section 6.7 Parachain Validation A validator's main purpose is to testify, as a well-bonded actor, that a parachain's block is valid including but not limited to any state transition, any external transactions included, the execution of any waiting posts in the ingress queue, and the final state of the egress queue. The process itself is fairly simple. 
Once the validator sealed the previous block, they are free to begin working to provide a candidate parachain block candidate for the next round of consensus. Initially, the validator finds a parachain block candidate through a parachain collator, described next, or one of its co-validators. The parachain block candidate data includes the block's header, the previous block's header, any external input data included, for Ethereum and Bitcoin such data would be referred to as transactions, however in principle they may include arbitrary data structures for arbitrary purposes, egress queue data and internal data to prove state transition validity. For Ethereum this would be the various state storage tree nodes required to execute each transaction. Experimental evidence shows this full data set for a recent Ethereum block to be at the most a few hundred KIB. Simultaneously, if not yet done, the validator will be attempting to retrieve information pertaining to the previous block's transition, initially from the previous block's validators and later from all validators signing for the availability of the data. Once the validator has received such a candidate block, they then validate it locally. The validation process is contained within the parachain class's validator module, a consensus-sensitive software module that must be written for any implementation of Polkadot, though in principle a library with a capital C space capital A B I could enable a single library to be shared between implementations with the appropriate reduction in safety coming from having only a single reference implementation. The process takes the previous block's header and verifies its identity through the recently agreed relay chain block in which its hash should be recorded. Once the parent header's validity is ascertained, the specific parachain class's validation function may be called. This is a single function accepting a number of data fields, roughly those given previously, and returning a symbol boolean proclaiming the validity of the block. Most such validation functions will first check the header fields which are able to be derived directly from the parent block, e.g. parent underscore hash number. Following this, they will populate any internal data structures as necessary in order to process transactions and or posts. For an Ethereum-like chain, this amounts to populating a tree database with the nodes that will be needed for the full execution of transactions. Other chain types may have other preparatory mechanisms. Once done, the ingress posts and external transactions, or whatever the external data represents, will be enacted, balanced according to chain specification. A sensible default might be to require all ingress posts be processed before external transactions be serviced. However, this should be for the parachain's logic to decide. Through this enactment, a series of egress posts will be created and it will be verified that these do indeed match the collator's candidate. Finally, the properly populated header will be checked against the candidate's header. With a fully validated candidate block, the validator can then vote for the hash of its header and send all requisite validation information to the co-validators in its subgroup. Section 6.7.1 Parachain Collators Parachain collators are unbonded operators who fulfill much of the task of miners on the present-day blockchain networks. They are specific to a particular parachain. In order to operate, they must maintain both the relay chain and the fully synchronized parachain. The precise meaning of fully synchronized will depend on the class of parachain, though will always include the present state of the parachain's ingress queue. In Ethereum's case, it also involves at least maintaining a Merkle tree database of the last few blocks, but might also include various other data structures, including Bloom filters for account existence, familial information, logging outputs, and reverse lookup tables for block number. In addition to keeping the two chains synchronized, it must also fish for transactions by maintaining a transaction queue and accepting properly validated transactions from the public network. With the queue and chain, it is able to create new candidate blocks for the validators chosen at each block, whose identity is known since the relay chain is synchronized, 
and submit them together with the various ancillary information such as proof of validity via the peer network. For its troubles, it collects all fees relating to the transactions it includes. Various economics float around this arrangement. In a heavily competitive market where there is a surplus of collators, it is possible that the transaction fees be shared with the parachain validators to incentivize the inclusion of a particular collator's block. Similarly, some collators may even raise the required fees that need to be paid in order to make the block more attractive to validators. In this case, a natural market should form with transactions paying higher fees, skipping the queue, and having faster inclusion in the chain. Section 6.8 Networking Networking on traditional blockchains like Ethereum and Bitcoin has rather simple requirements. All transactions and blocks are broadcast in a simple, undirected gossip. Synchronization is more involved, especially with Ethereum, but in reality this logic was contained in the peer strategy rather than the protocol itself, which resolved around a few request and answer message types. While Ethereum made progress on current protocol offerings with the dev P2P protocol, which allowed for many sub-protocols to be multiplexed over a single peer connection and thus have the same peer overlay support many P2P protocols simultaneously, the Ethereum portion of the protocol still remained relatively simple and the P2P protocol as a while remains unfinished with important functionality missing such as QoS support. Sadly, a desire to create a more ubiquitous Web3 protocol largely failed with the only projects using it being those explicitly funded from the Ethereum crowd sale. The requirements for Polkadot are rather more substantial. Rather than a wholly uniform network, Polkadot has several types of participants, each with different requirements over their peer makeup and several network avenues whose participants will tend to converse about particular data. This means a substantially more structured network overlay and a protocol supporting that will likely be necessary. Furthermore, extensibility to facilitate future additions, such as new kinds of chain, may themselves require a novel overlay structure. While an in-depth discussion of how the networking protocol may look is outside of the scope of this document, some requirements analysis is reasonable. We can roughly break down our network participants into two sets, relay chain, parachains, each of three subsets. We can also state that each of the parachain participants are only interested in conversing between themselves as opposed to participants in other parachains. Relay chain participants. Validators, uppercase P, split into subsets, uppercase P, open square bracket, lowercase s, close square bracket for each parachain. Availability guarantors, uppercase A, this may be represented by validators in the basic form of the protocol. Relay chain clients, uppercase M. Note members of each parachain set will also tend to be members of uppercase M. Parachain participants, parachain collators, uppercase C. Open square bracket, zero, close square bracket, uppercase C. Open square bracket, one, close square bracket. Parachain fishermen, uppercase F open square bracket, zero, close square bracket, uppercase F, open square bracket, one, close square bracket. Parachain clients, uppercase S, open square bracket, zero, close square bracket, uppercase S, open square bracket, one, close square bracket. Parachain light clients, uppercase L, open square bracket, zero, close square bracket, uppercase L, open square bracket one, close square bracket. In general, we name particular classes of communication will tend to take place between members of these sets. So now there is a list and each list item starts with a mathematical formula or a statement of some type. And I don't know how to read all of the symbols in these statements and I couldn't find a good guide online. So I'll only be reading the descriptions that follow after the statement but I will number each of the list items. All right, so for list item one, the description for the mathematical statement one is 
the full set of validators guarantors must be well connected to achieve consensus. List item two description is each validator as a member of a given parachain group will tend to gossip with other such members as the collators of the parachain to discover and share block candidates. List item three description is each availability guarantor will need to collect consensus sensitive cross-chain data from the validators assigned to it. Collators may also optimize the chance of consensus on their block by advertising it to availability guarantors. Once they have it, the data will be dispersed to other such guarantor to facilitate consensus. List item four. Parachain validators will need to collect additional input data from the previous set of validators or the availability guarantors. List item five. When reporting, fishermen may place a claim with any participant. List item six. General relay chain clients disperse data from validators and guarantors. List item seven. Parachain clients disperse data from the validators slash guarantors. List item eight. Parachain-like clients disperse data from the full clients. To ensure an efficient transport mechanism, a flat overlay network, like Ethereum's dev P2P, where each node does not non-arbitrarily differentiate fitness of its peers is unlikely to be suitable. A reasonably extensible peer selection and discovery mechanism will likely need to be included within the protocol, as well as aggressive planning a look ahead to ensure the right sort of peers are serendipitously connected at the right time. The precise strategy of peer makeup will be different for each class of participant. For a properly scaled out multi-chain, collators will either need to be continuously reconnecting to the accordingly elected validators, or will need ongoing agreements with a subset of the validators to ensure they are not disconnected during the vast majority of the time that they are useless for that validator. Collators will also naturally attempt to maintain one or more stable connections into the availability guarantor set to ensure swift propagation of their consensus sensitive data. Availability guarantors will mostly aim to maintain a stable connection to each other and to validators for consensus and the consensus critical parachain data to which they attest, as well as to some collators for the parachain data and some fishermen and full clients for dispersing information. Validators will tend to look for other validators, especially those in the same subgroup and any collators that can supply them with parachain block candidates. Fishermen, as well as general relay chain and parachain clients, will generally aim to keep a connection open to a validator or guarantor, but plenty of other nodes similar to themselves otherwise. Parachain-like clients will similarly aim to be connected to a full client of the parachain, if not just other parachain-like clients. Section 6.8.1, the problem of peer churn. In the basic protocol proposal, each of these subsets constantly alter randomly with each block as the validators assigned to verify the parachain transitions are randomly elected. This can be a problem should disparate non-peer nodes need to pass data between each other. One must either rely on a fairly distributed and well-connected peer network to ensure that the hop distance, and therefore worst case latency, only grows within the logarithm of the network size, a Kademlia-like protocol may help here, or one must introduce longer block times to allow the necessary connection negotiation to take place to keep a peer set that reflects the node's current communication needs. Neither of these are great solutions. Long block times being forced upon the network may render it useless for particular applications and chains. Even a perfectly fair and connected network will result in substantial wastage of bandwidth as it scales due to uninterested nodes having to forward data useless to them. While both directions may form part of the solution, a reasonable optimization to help minimize latency would be to restrict the volatility of these parachain validator sets, either reassigning the membership only between series of blocks, 
e.g. in groups of 15, which at a four second block time would mean altering connections only once per minute, or by rotating membership in an incremental fashion, e.g. changing by one member at a time, e.g. if there are 15 validators assigned to each parachain, then on average it would be a full minute before completely unique sets. By limiting the amount of peer churn and ensuring that advantageous peer connections are made well in advance through the partial predictability of parachain sets, we can help ensure each node keep a permanently serendipitous selection of peers.